The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 4, 5, and 6. Verses 4, 5, and 6 in the fourth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now here in these great verses, in this momentous statement, the uh, apostle is continuing this theme which he's introduced here at the beginning of this fourth uh, chapter. He's appealing, you remember, uh, to these Ephesians to walk worthy of the vocation uh, wherewith they have been called. They are to be worthy of this calling into which they have been called. He's coming to the practical application of his great doctrine. That is to be the principle which we must never lose sight of. We uh, are to walk according to this calling into which we have been called. It isn't a question for us to choose or to decide how we are to live as Christians. We have been created anew in Christ Jesus, as he reminds us in the second chapter, in the tenth verse, unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Anybody who quarrels, therefore, with the character of the Christian life is simply indicating that he is not clear as to what Christianity is. There should be no conflict in the mind of the Christian with respect to the calling to which he has been called. We are saved and redeemed, not merely and not only that we may not go to hell, but that we may be parts and portions of God's great purpose in this world, which is, you remember, finally, to reunite in the Lord Jesus Christ all things, whether they be in heaven or whether they be in earth. Now, here he takes up, first of all, as we've seen, the great question of maintaining the unity. We are to endeavor with all the power that is within us uh, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And he's told us what we have to do in that respect. We have to be lowly. We must have a poor conceit of ourselves. We must be meek. There must be an essential gentleness at the heart of our life. We are to be long-suffering toward others. We are to be very forbearing. And it's all to be done in love. In other words, his argument is this. You see, he started off with that word, therefore. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. What he's saying is that if you really grasp the doctrine of the first three chapters, this is inevitable. But knowing us as he does, he has to put it to us, and he has to put it simply and plainly and clearly to us. There is nothing more terrible than that anything in us, in our temperaments or characters, our whole life and deportment, should be a cause of division. Truth and error divide, but we are never to divide. There should never be anything in us that causes division. So we must be very careful about our characters. That's what he's been saying in verses 2 and 3. But now he comes on to give us reasons for this exhortation. And this again is so typical and characteristic of the great apostle's method. The New Testament never merely tells us to do something, it gives us reasons for doing it. You see, the mind is involved in Christianity. And uh, a presentation of the gospel which just asks people to surrender without their knowing quite why nor what they're doing is not true to the New Testament. The New Testament always gives its reasons. The mind is the greatest thing in men and truth comes to the mind and then affects the heart and that in turn leads to an action in the realm of the will. Now the great apostle, working according to that principle here, goes on to give us the abundant reason, the overwhelming reason why we should all 
with lowliness and meekness and long suffering for bearing one another in love, uh, should endeavor, uh, be urgent uh, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, here in these three verses, he puts it really in the form of one of his great statements with regard to the doctrine of the Christian church. That is really the subject with which he's going to deal until the end of verse 16. Now, I cannot forbear this remark in passing. It is really rather surprising to notice the amount of space and attention that is given in the New Testament to the doctrine of the church. It's, of course, the great theme of these epistles. It's true that the apostle was constantly concerned, as were the other writers, with particular difficulties and problems in the lives of members of the church. Yes, but he always deals with them by, first of all, laying down his doctrine of the church. Now, this is really a most important and a most vital principle. You read these epistles carefully, and I think you will notice that invariably, every appeal that is made to us is never made to us directly. It is always made to us in terms of our membership of the church and of our relationship to the church. This is the big thing. And we are but parts and portions of the church. So that if we don't understand the New Testament doctrine of the church, there is a sense in which all its appeals and exhortations and indicatives will be quite meaningless to us. Nothing is given directly, I say. It's all in terms of our position, which being interpreted, of course, means this. That uh, our troubles, and this is true of all of us, alas, our troubles arise chiefly from the fact that we will persist in starting with ourselves and in being subjective always. This, of course, is one of the results of sin. Sin puts man himself in the center. I alone am important, and it's what I feel and what's happening to me that matters, and I spend my time in thinking. Now, isn't that true of all of us? Now, the New Testament takes us right out of that. And it gives us this wonderful picture of the church. And it makes me see myself as just a unit in this, a member of this great mystical body of Christ. And the moment I begin to see things in that way, I'm delivered out of this miserable, morbid subjectivity. Now we thank God that in Christ and in the gospel there are wondrous blessings that nothing else can give us. But I say the way to cure ourselves of most of our ills and of our problems is to lift us ourselves right out of this subjectivity and to see ourselves where the New Testament puts us. Now, I'm just putting it like that in my own language to show you the great argument of this epistle. Now, that's what the apostle has been doing. You see, he's been laying down this great doctrine. He hasn't been dealing so much with individuals as showing the grand purpose of God. And here it is now in terms of the church. And what we have to do is to see ourselves as members of the church. And if we do that and work it out, well, then we shall be delivered from most of our troubles and of our trials. Everything, I say, must be in terms of the doctrine of the church. Well, now then, if that is true of all our problems, it is, of course, especially true of this whole question of unity, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, there are indications in the New Testament that there were already troubles. Take, for instance, that church at Corinth to which Paul wrote that first epistle of which we read the 12th chapter just now. His whole reason for writing the epistle was that there were divisions, sects, schisms in that church. And, and the apostle, of course, uh, has to write to them to deal with it. And what he is saying there in effect is this. He says, all your troubles are due to the fact that you've never understood, obviously, the nature of the Christian church. You're thinking of yourself still in this kind of atomistic manner as individuals, and therefore you formed into little groups of individuals. If you'd only seen the whole, the idea of the church, 
This would be quite impossible. So there, as here, he gives them a great exposition of the doctrine of the church. Now then, here I say he does it in these three verses in a very interesting way. He does it really by playing on the word one. You noticed it, didn't you? One body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. He repeats the word one, and thereby he is, of course, just establishing his great principle of the unity, the essential, the inevitable unity of the church. Now, this uh, statement is really interesting from every standpoint. It's interesting from the standpoint of what we may call the mechanics of interpretation. You notice that he repeats that word one seven times. He uses it seven times. Uh, what is this? Is it a suggestion of the number of divinity, which is seven, the number of God of perfection? I think it may well be. But I don't want to make too much of that. It may well be that he deliberately put it in this form in order that we may see that the unity of the church is a manifestation of the perfection of God, of the Godhead. But uh, another interesting point is to notice how he groups them. There are three in the fourth verse. There are three in the fifth verse. And there is the ultimate one. In the seventh verse, one body, one spirit, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Now the last you notice is a collection of great unities in itself. He keeps on repeating there uh, this all again. Uh, one God and Father of all who is above all, through all, in you all. He's repeating this same notion and idea of the essential unity. But again, another thing that we must of necessity notice is this. That the, each of the groups, each of the three groups, is arranged around one of the persons in the blessed Holy Trinity. The first three, you see, belong to the Holy Spirit. The second three belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son. And the final is God the Father himself. Now, this, of course, is done quite deliberately. It's the only way, really, in which we can enter into this doctrine and see its importance in our practical daily life and living. You see, we are taken right away and we stand face to face with the blessed Holy Trinity, the three in one, the one in three. The church is a reflection of that. The church is a manifestation of that. You see how the apostle leads the doctrine? You see, he doesn't just leave it as, that, as a personal appeal to us, that we're to be kind and long-suffering and good, that's all very essential, but oh, he says, if you only understood it all, if you only saw yourselves as members of the church and the church as a reflection on earth of this oneness, this triunity, the triune God, three in one, one in three, Holy Spirit, Son, Father, Don't you agree with me, my friends, that the whole trouble with the modern Christians is that they neglect doctrine? We talk about being practical. You can't be practical unless you know how to be practical. It's no use making direct personal appeals. We've got to see ourselves where we are and where God has placed us. We've been called. Now, one final point just in this matter of interpretation. You notice the order in which the apostle puts them. He starts with the Holy Spirit. He goes on to the Son. And he ends with God. Why this order, you think? 
Why not God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? Why does he reverse the order? Well, there is only one answer to that, and that is that he is primarily concerned to be practical. You see, this particular chapter is one of the practical chapters of this epistle. As I've been pointing out for several Sunday mornings, the, uh, the apostle would have said, my doctrine I've really laid down in chapters 1, 2, and 3. I'm now coming to the practical realm. This is his idea of being practical. Full of doctrine. Full of these glorious exhibitions of ultimate truth itself, nothing higher than this, the doctrine of the blessed Holy Trinity. Well then, I say he puts them in this order because he is deliberately being practical. He's starting with the church as she is. He's thinking of people who are members of the church. Very well, that's the fellowship of the Spirit, that is the community of the Spirit. He starts with us exactly where we are. And then, do you see, he arises from that if the church is the body, the head is Christ. Yes, and the head of Christ is God the Father. And so, from where we are, we go through the one and only mediator to God the Father. He's using the practical, experimental method in order that he may raise us up with him and enable us to see it as it is. He's not just giving us some dry-as-dust doctrine, remote and far away. No, no, he's really meeting us where we are, and he's going to show us now you are where you are and what you are because of the work of the Spirit. Yes, and the Spirit would never have come, he would never have been sent, he would never have been given, were it not for the Son and what he's done. And the Son would never have come, were it not that God so loved the world that he he gave his only begotten son. Oh, look at it any way you like. This order is very wonderful. Look at it if you like, even in terms of your personal position at this very moment. As a Christian, you're not left to yourself. The Holy Spirit is in you. And he will lead you to the Son. He will teach you how to pray. We know not what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit maketh intercession within us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he'll bring you to the Son, and the Son will introduce you as the mediator and the great high priest unto the Father. That's it. Well, now then, that is, I say, the uh, reason, surely, uh, why the Apostle uh, puts it in this uh, particular form. Now then, let's follow him as he works it out. You see, what he is concerned to show us is this. That there's no need to argue about this question of the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He says it's, it's there, it's inevitable. Now, you notice how this authorized translation puts it, there is one body. Now, the words there is are supplied. They're not in the original at all. The apostle really put it like this with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, one body, one Spirit, one called in one hope of your calling, and so on. Now, the translators very rightly have supplied, there is. In other words, they're reminding us of this, that the apostle is not appealing to us to form a unity, what he's telling us again is that there is this unity and that all he's asking us to do is not to break it, endeavoring to keep it, to guard it, to safeguard it. He's not calling us to some great appeal to come together. No, no. He says, oh, no, no, that's not the position. There is a unity. There is one body. It's there. And what he says is this, you be careful that you don't break it in any way or that you are not the cause of any kind of rupture or of schism. Very well then. Let us look at the unity first of all as it is to be seen in connection with the Holy Spirit and his work. Now that's the theme of the fourth verse. This first group of three centering round the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Now the apostle, I say, starts with this because of his practical uh, concern. So the first thing he does is to remind us 
of what we are as the member as members of the church and in doing that you notice that he uses this analogy of the body one body now i think that any careful examination of the epistles of this mighty men must lead us to the conclusion that this was his favorite illustration when he was dealing with the doctrine of the church the body he's got other illustrations we've already seen them we've come across them in the second chapter of this epistle he compares the church to a great empire fellow citizens with the saints he says the church is an empire not only that members of the household of god the church is like a family not only that the church is like a building you have been built together he says on the foundation of the apostles and prophets a mighty edifice is going up later in this epistle we shall find him comparing the church to a bride the church is the bride of christ and the relationship between the lord himself and the church is the relationship between a husband and a wife hence that extraordinary passage at the end of chapter 5 and he has other illustrations in various other places but you go through his epistles and i think you will find that he uses this particular illustration more frequently than any other and obviously therefore he found in it uh, certain things which give uh, us a picture and especially of this unity of the church in a clearer manner than in any other well now he's already referred to this twice already First of all he does it in chapter 1 at the end of the chapter he says and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all and in all and again he's repeated it in chapter 2 verse 16 and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross having slain the enmity thereby and indeed in all his talk in the second chapter about making of twain one new man he's really using the same illustration now there in those two instances he has merely as it were mentioned it in passing what he does here is to take it up and to expound it and to elaborate it I've many times compared this apostle's method to that of a musical composer. In the overture he suggests his theme and no more than suggests them, but then in the body of the work he takes up the suggestions and deals with them and works them out in greater detail. That's exactly what he's doing here. Now what does he mean by referring to the church as the body? One body This is a most important question and especially at the present time with all this interest in church unity and ecumenicity. Now isn't it obvious that the apostle must of necessity be referring to the mystical unseen and spiritual church and body? I say that this is inevitable and must of necessity be the case for this reason. it cannot mean the visible and the external church for the good reason that the visible and the external church consists of many bodies a multiplicity of bodies now the apostle therefore was not thinking of that what he's talking about is this essential church this invisible mystical church which is the invisible mystical body of christ Now that is a very important principle in the New Testament and failure to grasp that of course has led to many tragedies in the long history of the church the Roman Catholic Church failing to understand this would say for instance today that she is the only church and that all other visible churches are not churches at all and there have other there have been others who have said the same thing that's a complete failure to understand the mystical internal invisible character of the true and the essential church now what the apostle is therefore asserting is this 
There is only one such true church. There cannot be many because the church is the body of Christ. And on the analogy, a man can't have many bodies. There is only one. There is one perfect mystical church, unseen, spiritual. She's there. There is one body. And it is the only body. Now, this is, I think, one of the most glorious conceptions we can ever lay hold of. This church consists of people of all types and kinds, all colors, all continents, all climes. These things make no difference to this invisible, mystical church. There are men in this church of all nations under heaven, of all tribes and peoples everywhere. Not only that, time makes no difference to this. The early Christians, the first Christians, are in this body. The martyrs of the Reformation are in the same body. The Puritans, the Covenanters, the first Methodists, they're all in this body. And you and I are in this body if we are truly in Christ. It spans the centuries. Natural abilities make no difference with respect to this. It doesn't matter what you are, whether you're ignorant or knowledgeable, clever or lacking in faculties, great or small, wealthy or poor. All these things are utter irrelevances. This body is one. And it is the church of all the ages, the fullness of God's people, that is the body, and it's the only body. It is this unseen, mystical church. Oh, what a tragedy it is that one in honesty has to go on to say a thing like this. That nothing matters but your membership of that church. You can be a member of this church or of any other visible church. And alas, not be a member of that mystical, unseen church. The New Testament itself teaches that. But my dear friend, the membership of the visible church is nothing. It won't help you. It's as useless as circumcision was. This is the thing that matters, that you're in this unseen, mystical, spiritual church, which alone is the body of Christ. Very well, then, there are certain things that we must understand about this. And obviously, the apostle felt that this picture, this analogy, conveys it very perfectly. That is why he makes such frequent use of it. Now, as I come to expound it, all I have to do really is to remind you of what the Apostle said in the 12th chapter of the first epistle to the Corinthians. Because there he really has taken up this subject and has dealt with it in a most exhaustive manner. There is really nothing more to be said. The whole doctrine of the church as the mystical body of Christ is there once and forever. What are the principles? Here they are. The first thing, obviously, is to realize the organic character of this unity that is in the church. The church, you see, is a new creation. That's the principle. When God, uh, through Christ by the Spirit, set out to form the church, this is his great plan, that all things may be reunited in Christ. So Paul says, he called us Jews, he's called you Gentiles. We've got a share in the inheritance, you've got a share in the inheritance. But in doing this, God has done something absolutely new. He didn't just take a Jew and a Gentile and bring them together somehow in a kind of coalition. They didn't just sit down together around a table and agree to be friendly. No, no. The church is a new creation. As God made the world out of nothing at the beginning, so he has made the church out of nothing. The church is not a collection of parts. The old has been destroyed. There is no longer Jew nor Gentile. That's done away with if you're in this body. 
There has been a destruction in you before there has been a new creation. And you've been delivered from that, the things which separated, and this one, through creative twain, one new man. Now this is a tremendously vital principle. May I put it very simply in terms of this analogy by putting it to you like this. It's all to be seen in the nature of the human body which consists of ten fingers, ten toes, two hands, two feet, two legs, two arms, so on. Yes, of course. But you see, the body is not a collection of these parts. And none of these parts really have been created independently or separately and then put on together. That isn't how the body develops. That isn't how the body comes into being at all. What is the story of the body and its development? Well, isn't it this? It all starts as just one cell. One cell. And out of that everything else comes. God doesn't form a number of fingers and then make a hand and attach the fingers. No, no. It starts the other way around. Here is this one cell. And that now begins to develop and to grow. And it shoots off little buds. And one of them will eventually be the right forearm and arm and hand. The other one goes off on the left. The trunk comes down. The legs come off the trunk. It all comes out of this original primitive cell. The parts haven't had an independent being ever. They're all offshoots, outgrowths of this central primitive cell. This, therefore, there is an essential unity. Now, that's the illustration. And that, you see, is the truth of us as members of the Christian church. That is where the visible church, which is so essential, we must have visible churches, but that is where the visible church can so mislead us. You see, what happens here is this, isn't it? You have a church role, and I say, oh, you want to be a member, your name shall be added. It's got to be done that way, but you see, it gives us a false notion. You're not added to Christ in that sense. No, no, this is a new creation. This mystical thing. We come out of him, born of the Spirit, born of Christ, partakers of the divine nature. And the moment you see it like that, you see how inevitable this unity is. Very well, there is the first thing that we see in terms of this picture, but let me go on. The second thing that the Apostle stresses and emphasizes is, of course, the diversity in the unity. And that scarcely needs any exposition at all because it's so obvious. But let me put it in a negative. What you have in the church is unity, not uniformity. Now, I rather like the way the Apostle deals with this in 1 Corinthians 12. Did you notice the sarcasm? Did you notice his use of ridicule? Look at him, mastery, the masterly way in which he handles that illustration. He says, now look here, I'm, I'm receiving letters from those that belong to the household of Chloe and others, and they're telling me that one says, I am of Paul, another of Apollos, and another of Cephas, and you're all divided and are wrangling and are arguing. He says, what's the matter with you? Have you forgotten the illustration? Have you forgotten that the church is the body of Christ? Look what you're doing, he says. What you are really saying is this, that, that the eye says to the hand, I have no need of thee. And the foot is envying the ear, something like that. The whole thing, he says, is monstrous. He ridicules it out of court. That's just another way of saying that the principle is that in the church you have diversity. In unity. And both things must be emphasized. And any teaching that would represent the church as being a dull uniformity is unscriptural. There is a variety in the essential unity. Look at a finger and contrast it with an eye. Well, in a sense, you feel that they don't belong to the same world, leave alone to the same body. Finger is something very ordinary. Nothing very wonderful about a finger as such, but oh, think of the eye. I sometimes think there's no instrument in the world that is comparable to the eye. The delicacy, the subtlety, the refinement, the balance, the tenderness. What an instrument. And I say at first sight, 
It appears as if there is no relationship at all between something like an eye and a finger or a foot or other parts of the body which are still less comely. And yet, you see, the whole point is this, that though they're all so different, though they all look so different and subserve different functions, they're all one in this essential sense. They all belong together. And they're all essential parts of the body. And you don't have a body without every one of them being there. Diverse, yet unity. Work that out for yourselves and then take it in terms of this other principle also. The interdependence of the one part upon the other. Not one of them, you see, has any real sense or meaning or existence on its own and in and of itself. As the apostle puts it, if the whole of the body were a hand, well, it wouldn't be a body. If the whole were a foot, it wouldn't be a body. You can call a thing like that a body. What makes the body the body is these, all these various parts in this one organic whole in this essential unity. And he says, moreover, they're all absolutely interdependent upon one another. You see, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee. If you haven't got hands well, you'll find yourself very crippled and rather helpless, won't you? The eye can't work the whole body. No, no. There is none of this independence. Each part derives its meaning, its essence, from its relationship to the rest. That's the truth about the body. It is equally true, says the apostle, about the church. Each one needs the other, and each one benefits by the functions of the other. And then that argument about the less comely parts and so on. He says if you've got a right conception of the body, you won't despise any part of your body. You know, Christian people in past centuries have done that. Some have even despised the physical body in and of itself. And have said, now that we are spiritual, the body is of no concern. That's utterly unscriptural. That is where some of that false mysticism of the East goes wrong. The body is a part of men. And when man is finally saved, the body even will be glorified and perfect. Well, now, it's exactly the same in this analogy about the church. No part is unimportant. Every part counts. Every single member of the church is a most important person. People sometimes say to me, I've heard it said to me not only here but elsewhere, Ah, oh, you know, I'm not a very important member. To which the reply is, there's no such thing as an unimportant church member. What they mean, of course, is they don't have some very obvious flashy gifts. They don't have these unusual gifts that some of these people at Corinth had. They may mean that they can't speak or preach or pray in public eloquently or something. But they're despising the gift that they have got. On the less comely members, we bestow the more abundant honor. Everyone is essential to the life of the church. For the harmonious working of the whole, I've sometimes even put it like this. The mere fact that you're a member of a church and sit in a seat is a great thing in and of itself. It helps the preacher. It's a disheartening thing to a preacher to have empty seats. So that merely sitting in a seat is a help to the whole work, to the man who may be given the preaching gift. You see, all matters. And therefore, anything we do to cut across this idea of the interdependence is not only being false to the doctrine, it is introducing a kind of artificial division. It is being guilty of schism in some shape or form. And then the last principle which I must hold before you, I can put like this. All the parts of the body work together to the same grand end. They have the same objective. And that is, of course, the true functioning of the body. Each one of them has got its own function, yes, but you see, it plays its part in the whole. A man thinks with his brain and he acts with his will. Yes, but he must have the instrument to carry it out. 
He must be able to do it. I want to shut this book. I do it with my hands. I think it. I will it. But I put it into practice with my hands. What if I were without hands and without arms? I couldn't shut the book. So they all, you see, thus subserve one great function and they all work to the same great end and objective. And the church is the body of Christ and we are members in particular. We've already seen in chapter 3 verse 10 that it is through the church that God is going to do certain things even to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. There they are, the principalities and powers, looking down over the ramparts of heaven. And it is through the church, through you and through me, every one of us, all of us together, that these principalities and powers are really beginning to understand the manifold wisdom of God. That's what we are called to. And oh, then let us remember this. Did you notice how he puts it there in 1 Corinthians 12? Because of this essential unity, if one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. You can't say, ah, my little finger is ill. No, no. If your little finger is ill, you are ill. If there's pain there, you are feeling pain. You can't divorce yourself from your little finger. This unity of the body, the same blood flows everywhere. There is this vital power animating the whole. And therefore, because of that, if one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. And if one member be honored, all the members glory together with it. Don't you see it, my friends? If we only understood this doctrine of the church, any idea of Competition, rivalry, jealousy, envy, self-seeking, self-importance would be utterly impossible. They'd be ludicrous. And as and when we are guilty of such things, we are just proclaiming that we've never understood the doctrine of the church. So the way to avoid that, you see, is to get the doctrine clear. Don't rush to the practicalities. Get hold of the doctrine. Oh, what a privilege this is. You and I are members of the body of Christ. That's our relationship to him. He is the head. And we are the several members. There's nothing beyond this. This is privilege. You see, the psalmist in Psalm 84 says, I would sooner be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. That's wonderful. Yes, better be a doorkeeper in the palace of the king, as it were. But this goes infinitely beyond that. We are in Christ. We belong to him. We as Christians are parts of his spiritual mystical body. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. If we realize that, we shall inevitably endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.